Welcome uh, all to the new academic season of the B2C Computational Biology uh, Seminar Series that we have started last year. So today we have the pleasure to have Rudy Gunawan, um, who is uh, from the Institute for Chemical and Bioengineering uh, of the ETH Zurich. So I will go briefly uh, a couple of dates of your career. Um, Rudy has obtained his PhD in 2003 in chemical engineering at the University of Illinois Urbana Champaign in the US. Then, from 2003 to 2006, he was a postdoctoral uh, research fellow at the University of California, Santa Barbara in the US. Then, he uh, was fellow in chemical and pharmaceutical engineering at Singapore MIT Alliance for Research and Technology in Singapore and was also appointed as assistant professor at the National University of Singapore. And in 2011, uh, he moved to Europe and became assistant professor at the ETH Zurich, where now he leads the Chemical and Biological System Engineering Laboratory. So his research interests um, primarily lie at the intersection of systems uh, engineering and biology, and more specifically systems modeling and analysis of cellular networks. So his, uh, his research group activities uh, focus on the development of methods for model uh, identification and analysis of gene regulatory networks, signal tr 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 transduction pathways, sorry, and metabolic networks. And uh, today we will uh, share with us some of uh, the tools developed uh, in the group, and uh, as well as the work used for um, biological network inference. So, Rudy, thank you again for accepting our invitation, and the, state, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Diane, and of course, uh, thank you for organizing this and inviting this, and thank you for bearing with my incessant emails, sorry about that. Uh, for those of you in the audience, uh, thank you for coming, and for those of you watching the webcast, uh, thank you for listening. Uh, I have to be honest, this is my first time delivering a webinar, so I will probably do a few faux pas here and there, so I hope that you can bear with me. Um, as you can see, the title of my talk today, Ensemble Based Design of Experiments and for Biological Network Inference, and the, the word ensemble here refers to uh, the idea of doing an ensemble modeling where we are uh, looking at uh, tracking a set of family of uh, mathematical models for biological network and using that as a way to represent uncertainty. And uh, the, 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 the title also suggests that we are going to be look, using this ensemble as a way to uh, design experiments. And you'll see a little bit about that. <clears throat> so I'll start with a, a short introduction about my lab and the scope, as Diane said, Chemical and Biological Systems Engineering Lab. Um, so, uh, disclosure, I'm an engineer by training, so uh, you'll see a little bit some evidence of this in the way we looked at our problems. Um, also, as uh, Diane mentioned, that we looked at our research looks at, uh, lies at the intersection between systems modeling analysis, building uh, mathematical modeling, in particular of biological networks. And uh, there are two uh, research, uh, parallel research tracks in, in my lab at the moment. On one side, we're looking at development of uh, methods and tools to extract or what we call reverse engineer uh, models from data. And on the other side, we are uh, interested in look at one particular application where we have been looking at uh, the biology of aging, in particular looking at mitochondrial DNA mutations. Um, and for today's lecture and seminar, uh, we'll be talking mainly on the first uh, track, which is development of method to do uh, biological network inference. And I think I really don't have to uh, talk too much or motivate this problem to this audience because, you know, uh, you guys have been looking at the forefront of looking at uh, biological data, omics data, and extracting networks out of that. Yeah, so these are an activity called network inference. And what I just want to stress here is that a lot of time we are dealing with this problem called underdetermined in, in the mathematical terms. And they, they have different names here, of course, of the dimensionality, where you have high dimensional data but low number of samples. 
uh, or what Mike Stump from Imperial College mentioned, data rich, hypothesis rich. We do live in a, in a, in a situation where you have tsunami of biological data, so data rich environment, but uh, we also have a very rich hypothesis. There are many, many different hypotheses that could, one could formulate to fit the same biological data. And of course, the, the activity of network is inference is, is, is not linear like what you saw in this uh, slide, rather it's an iterative process. And a lot of times this starts with uh, some prior knowledge of whatever the, the, your, your, perhaps your collaborators gave you, uh, 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 or also what you can find from the literature. And then you start by, uh, let me see my cursor here, uh, and then you can start based on the prior knowledge, existing knowledge, you could start writing down uh, the model equations. Uh, and a lot of times, uh, some of the parameters are unknown, and then you can do parameter estimation. Again, to stress here that these steps are underdetermined mathematically. Uh, and then the next step would be to look at model validation. Uh, well, I put here model invalidation because you can't really fully validate a model uh, if the model is sufficiently good enough for your purpose then you can use that. Otherwise, um, you go back to do more experiments. And this is where I think the, the model-based design of experiments could be of value. And this is the topic of the, the lecture today. So I'm going to be talking about uh, basically two strategies that we have uh, developed. Uh, some of these are under review, so it's not published. Perhaps some of these are unpublishable, so we will <laughs> let remains to be seen. Uh, but I'm just going to give you uh, two strategies that we have come up with. Yeah. So the first one is uh, design of experiments, particularly looking at uh, deciding the best knockout experiments, gene knockout experiments, for the purpose of gene regulatory network inference. I'm going to try to motivate this problem by looking at gene regulatory networks as a, a simple graph, a simple directed graph in this case. And this is a problem that people see uh, very often that one would want to do if you have a gene expression data. And by the way, a lot of these uh, problems could fall under the umbrella of causal inference. They decide extracting causal relationships among nodes, which where the nodes here are genes, and the edges uh, reflects the um, regulatory interaction. So if you have uh, an arrow from node I to node J, that means you are saying gene I is regulating the expression of gene J. Um, so the inference of uh, gene regulatory networks from uh, Expression profile is still an unsolved problem, even after uh, this many years, yeah? And this is something that uh, dream challenges, and I think some of the people in SIB are participating in this also. And that the finding is that, um, that this inform problems is undetermined, and especially uh, differentiating direct versus indirect regulation is something that is uh, quite challenging. And why is that? And this is one of the things that we are trying to address in our tool called Trace. And you'll see in a little bit what that is. So we uh, go back to the idea of knocking out or breaking the network as a way to infer it. Yeah? So breaking the network, in this case, means uh, performing a gene knockout. Let's, uh, for, for an illustration purpose, consider the following simple example where you have five genes, are very simple arrows, uh, uh, about five arrows here. And the idea is that if you were to knock out A, and under steady state condition, if you perturbation of A would lead differential expression, not only in the B, uh, gene B and D, which are directly regulated by A, but also all the genes that are downstream of A. So what you get from the differential expression potentially are all the genes that are directly and indirectly regulated by A. The same way if you were to attack B, knock out B, you'll see maybe uh, C being uh, differentially expressed, but also then D and E. So you can, you can repeat this uh, exercise, and what you'll get out of um, the uh, gene knockout data and at steady state is essentially a transitive closure of the graph or uh, the accessibility relationships among the nodes. And that's just a fundamental problem with the data and it has nothing to do with the methods. So this is where we are, what we're trying to, to uh, convey, that it's not the problem with the method, but rather it's a problem with the data and the way the experiments are done. So of course then later on we will use this as a motivation to design better experiments. So, so how do we cope with, with an underdetermined problem? Uh, so in this case, we know that 
uh, for a given translator closure, you could actually have many, many directed graphs that have the same closure. Yeah, so this is, mathematically, this is what uh, describes this indistinguishability problem. Yeah, so this, the idea that is you could have a, an ensemble of graphs with the same transit closure. Yeah? So keeping this in mind, uh, that uh, the, the strategy that we are developing recently, this was published last year, is called TRACE. Uh, TRACE stands for Transit Reduction and Closure Ensemble Method. And what we want to address here is the ensemble nature of the, the multiplicity of the solution. So the solution that what Trace produce is an ensemble. In particular, we are producing upper and lower bound of the ensemble. The upper bound represents the most complicated graph that could agree, that agree with the data. And the, uh, the lower bound is the least complicated simplest in the terms of the number of edges. So that's what TRACE does. TRACE takes input differential gene expression data uh, from gene knockout experiments and produces upper and lower bounds of the ensemble. If you, if you want to construct all members of the ensemble, there is an easy way to do this, but we don't really uh, you know, advise you to do that because this, the number of graphs could be unmanageable. So I'm just going to describe to you a little bit how we do this. And I've described already how we constructed, how you can construct um, an accessibility uh, relationship from a single gene knockout. What we did in TRACE is that we generalized this to n uh, multiple gene knockouts. Yeah? So we treat any n gene knockout simply as a single gene knockout in the background of n minus 1 gene deletion. So that's, that's essentially the trick that we did. So with, if you give me a uh, single gene knockout, double gene knockout, three gene knockout, I could construct from them accessibility relationships. But not just accessibility relationships of the gene regulatory network that you are interested in. For the N minus one gene deletions, then you have the gene regulatory networks associated with the deletion of this N minus one. What do I mean by that? If you, for example, consider the complete set of double gene knockout involving B, yeah, for this uh, small uh, uh, example. So these are knocks out of A, a B, uh, B, C, and B, D. So essentially, you, you have single gene knockouts of the following uh, gene regulatory network, yeah, what we call GB here. So the difference between this gene regulatory network from the original one is that we have removed edges from the B network, uh, the node. Uh, B in this case. And what you get from uh, A, B, B, C, B, D uh, expression, expression profiles are the transitive closure of this network. That's what we did earlier. Okay, and the second step, what we did is what we call transitive reduction. Um, transitive reduction actually is a, a, a directed graph which has the minimum number of edges among all possible graphs that have the same uh, transitive closure from the accessibility relationships that you had earlier. So this is something that has been done. Uh, an algorithm exists from the 1970s. Uh, we know that the transitive reduction of a, a DAG, a directed acyclic graph, if you don't have cycles, then you have a unique uh, transitive uh, reduction. But if you have cycles, which is something that you have to deal with when you are looking at real gene regulatory networks, this is, there are multiple solutions. So what we did there is that we, we simply remove edges from uh, cycles because as you'll see in a little bit, these then, uh, what we did essentially, we assigned these edges as uncertain edges, yeah? So to and just give a bit of a background, to determine really the direction of the cycle, we need to break that cycle. Okay, and the third and last step is we then now have uh, since we now have accessibility relationships or so transitive closures, and then we have for each transitive closures, uh, the transitive reduction, what we did finally in the third step is to merge them. So it is, this is a simple exercise where for the upper bound, we simply take an intersection of the edges, set, the set of edges, and the, for the lower bound, we take the union of the set of edges. So, so here, here, upper bound GU is the most complicated network that agrees with the data that you have, and the lower bound is the least complicated network that also agree with the data that you have. Yeah? Uh, 
For this particular example, it just so happened in this case that the lower bound is act the actual uh, general regulatory network. However, you can never be sure from the experiment which one is the, the true network. So this is what trace does. So you, you again, it produces upper and lower bound, and and we didn't uh, we didn't think that one needs to enumerate all possible ensemble, and that's a, a rather compact way to represent the whole uh, family of solutions here. And what we did now recently is we take the idea of uh, having upper lower bound of the ensemble and use these to design experiments. And here the idea is. Can you tell me the best gene knockout that I should do next to be able to guide the uh, uh, the network inference? Yeah, and for these reasons, uh, we define what we call uncertain edges from the upper lower bound. Here, I'm going to illustrate the the principle that we came up with for the for finding the optimal gene knockouts using this uh, simple exercise. So uh, let us. For the moment, imagine we have the following upper and lower bound. So in this case, we have uh, edges that appear in the upper bound, but not in the lower bound. And for those edges are what we call uncertain edges. Yeah? So for, for this particular example, we have the edge AB, the regulation A to F, sorry, not AB, AF, A to F, and then BG, regulation of G by B, right? Um, so these are can be easily identified from the upper lower bound by just look, looking at the difference of set. Now the basic idea of finding out the optimal gene knockout is the following: if we can disconnect all indirect paths, yeah, from that are associated with an uncertain uh, edge. For example, here for the the edge AF, let's imagine if we were to knock out. C, if C is not there, then confirming the fact or confirming whether AF exists in the network is a simple experiment of perturbing A. Yeah, so it's about disconnecting indirect paths that are associated uh, with uh, an uncertain edge. So for BG, we can imagine by the same principle we can knock out B. So if we were to knock out B, then confirming whether you have a BG uh, edge, it's a simple perturbation of B, because we no longer have the indirect paths. Yeah? For this particular example, there is actually an optimal knockout, which is E. The reason is that when we knock out E, we can confirm both AB, or AF, and BG. Yeah, of course, this is uh, this will involve an individual perturbation of A and a separate perturbation of B. Yeah, so that with that basic uh, idea, we then define what we call edge separatoid of an uncertain uh, uh, of an edge. Yeah, the edge separatoid of I J. You give me an uncertain edge, node I to J. Then um, the separatoid of this edge is the set of nodes whose removal would enable the verification of that edge by the same principle that you saw in the, in the examples. Yeah? And these, we, can, uh, we came up with three uh, sets. There are many, many sets of uh, many, many ways to define or, or arrive at the edge separatoids of a given uncertain edge. The reason why we chose these three is because just purely for computational reasons. They are easy to identify and there are not too many of them to, to store. Yeah? And, and you'll see in a little bit that during the optimization, we have to store all of these separate toids uh, while doing the online optimization. So uh, for the set BG, what are these three separate toids, uh, sets of separate toids? The first one is the progenies of B and the uh, intersections of the progenies of B and the ancestors of G. Yeah? So that's that guy. And uh, the other set, the second separatoid, uh, we consider is the descendants of B, intersection with the parents of G. And finally, uh, we also consider the intersection of descendants of B and ancestors of G. So all of these are possible uh, nodes that you can knock out, for which you can then remove uh, mm -hmm. and verify the uncertain edge directly. So that's the basic principle. And what we did is then we, we wrap this with uh, an optimization, yeah? So this is a, a simple integer programming problem. 
we actually didn't use anything fancy. We used genetic algorithm. Of, of course, uh, you can use more advanced uh, programming algorithm. With the genetic algorithm, we, we were okay with that. That's the first thing that actually we tried. And for the EcoI network, we could get a solution in, in about 90 seconds, so we were quite happy with that. Nevertheless, we, we realized that uh, you can use much, much uh, better uh, integer programming algorithms. But the idea here is very simple. Find the optimal combination of gene knockouts so that I can verify the highest number of uncertain match. And that's my, the basic principle design, behind the design of experiments here. And we can put in constraints. For example, you don't want to knock out essential genes. These are genes whose knockout will be lethal. You could also limit the number of simultaneous gene knockouts, because obviously you know, the, the likelihood of you having synthetic lethality of 10 genes, knocking out 10 genes simultaneously, could be very high. But two or three, perhaps, this is something that you can work with. So the tool is available. Manuscript is kind of only under review. Uh, hopefully, it's published uh, very soon. Um, so the idea here is to do this iteration. Yeah? So we begin with uh, some prior data. And using trace, for example, you can generate upper lower bound. And using reduce, we can then design the experiments. Then we can give this, fit this back to the, uh, the experimentalist. Then they can do the experiments for us. Once you get the data, then you can update the ensemble bounds. And that's the loop that we are uh, doing uh, in the next couple of uh, slides. Yeah? So we are doing these iterations. So it's proof of concept. We applied this to E. coli gene regulatory network. Uh, first, under ideal uh, scenario where we don't have noise, we don't consider noise. Uh, this is unrealistic, but we'll, we'll, we'll show an example where we actually put in noise. Uh, so this is probably about 1,600 nodes, about 3,800 uh, edges. Uh, the constraints is that we exclude essential genes. Uh, these are set that we, we got from the literature. And we also put a limit on the simultaneous gene knockouts. So the first exercise that we did was, let's limit to the num number of knockout to 10. I know this, uh, you know, actually we got a reviewer comment saying that, okay, look, 10 is very high. Uh, I'll show you in a little bit uh, why uh, sort of modification of that. So up to 10, we can get to the true network. Yeah, so what I'm showing you here is the jackup distance of the upper bound uh, from the true network and of the lower bound from the true network. In the, we put a negative there. So when, when you see this, I want to see the cursor. Uh, so when you see this coming down, that means the, upper, the distance between upper bound and the true network reduces. And same way if this come up for the lower bound, that's the distance between lower bound and the true network decreases. And when they meet, that's when you, you get the convergence, that unique solution. Yeah? This is a condition what we call network. Uh, the network is inferable in this case. So 166 iterations uh, involving about 430 knockout experiments. So, so the reviewer came, uh, comments came and saying, look, you can't do probably 10. Uh, so we did something that is different, where we do perform the iteration uh, whereby we in gradually increase the number of knockouts. So we start with double G knockout. And we perform until the uh, reduce will, will not give you any more uh, solution. And that's hap that happens when the set of separatoids all involve more than uh, two, two genes. Yeah? So we did this. So you can see now, you, you, you sort of see the, the steps. So where we, we did up to two, up to three, up to four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Two, so just, just we did this all the way to convergence, basically. Yeah? And uh, so I think not surprisingly, the here we, we require more iterations and also more knockout experiments. However, it's, it's, it's I think, notable to, to, to say here is that limiting the gene knockouts to up to three genes, we can already verify about 95% of the uncertain edges. So that's, I think, is quite useful in that regard. We also applied this to uh, Dream Challenge 100 gene uh, network. And this is the, de where, where the data we can actually generate using GNET Weaver. And this is a, a product of uh, not too far from here, I think. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so we, we use that uh, platform as a, as a way to generate benchmark data. So, we, uh, so this is the results of the number of verified edges for network one, two, three, four, and five. There are five networks, gold standard networks in that challenge. 
Um, the colorful bar here uh, shows uh, different, uh, well, the results from the iterations, and we did this until convergence. So all of the uh, iteration converged to a single solution, but you notice here a little bit, um, I don't know if the cursor is there, okay. So that uh, we don't get all true positive and true negatives. We have false positive and false negatives. I think that's sort of uh, unavoidable when once you deal with uh, real data or noisy data. So the iterative, the iterative procedure can give us a unique solution, but that unique solution is not a true network. Yeah. So I think this is something that one has to deal with as soon as we, we, we start dealing with noise because of the certain statistical significance that you perhaps have to do, a uh, certain cutoff that you have to do when you decide whether an edge exists or not. Um, now, we also noted that the errors were mostly associated with uh, fan-in motives. So fan-in motives is when you have uh, multiple regulators of a single gene. So in that case, what happened, if you knock out just one of the regulator, you may not see any uh, response in the, in the downstream genes. And because of uh, complementary comp compensation effects, yeah. So this is something that uh, perhaps it's a limitation in the data. It's not really the method problem, but it's really the problem with the fact that you have multiple regulators of a single gene. Okay, um, just to sh compare a little bit with the double gene knockout, you see here. I forgot to show you the results of the double gene knockout. So, so the gray bar here is uh, the number of edges verified by double gene knockouts. Uh, this one is a little bit more complicated. Maybe I'll skip this uh, outcome, this results for the uh, for the seminar. But we compared this to the, to, to the complete set of double gene knockouts, and we were able to verify uh, more edges. But also here, the, this table shows that we can verify those uh, more edges in fewer experiments. Yeah. So the total number of knockout experiments, as you see uh, in the last column here. Yeah, it's, it's much, much lower than if you were to perform, just systematically perform all possible double gene accounts. Okay, so we could, with this design, be able to provide uh, more informative data yeah, per, per gene account experiments. Okay, um, so that's sort of the first half of my talk. And in the second half, I'm going to switch gear and talk a, a different type of modeling, of, also of the gene regulatory networks. Where in this case, we are looking at more of a, what I would call it an engineering uh, model. Um, here, we're considering um, writing down differential equations model for the gene regulatory networks uh, of this type. So here, x would be you know, the derivative, uh, the change in concentration if you, if you are from the engineering side. So these are change in concentration as a function of time. S here is the stoichiometry, if you're doing with metabolic networks, or you can also call this connectivity or structure of the network. Uh, v uh, encapsulates the, the kinetics. Yeah, if you look at the edges uh, in this example, for example, that, that describes the nature, uh, the dynamics of that uh, edge. And P is the parameters. When you're dealing with this type of models, not only you have now have a structural uncertainty potentially, but you can have kinetic uncertainty and parameter uncertainty. Yeah? So when you deal with underdetermined problem, this comes in at multiple levels when you start looking at more detailed uh, modeling of, of this kind. And, and for, for the illustration in, this, in the case study, we're going to consider the myeloid uh, progenitor uh, cell differentiation signaling, uh, not signaling, gene regulatory network shown here on the left. Um, in this regard, what we're going to consider uh, uncertainty in both the structure as well as in the parameters. And I'll show you a little bit how we, we, we do that. For the parametric uncertainty, we actually have a tool now already available on our website. So that's this sort of uh, an advertisement. So what we call redemption, uh, it stands for reduced dimension ensemble modeling and parameter estimation. So, so what it does is it, it provides, it, this is done in MATLAB, so, so that's the engineering side of us. So we write this in MATLAB. Uh, <laughs> I, we, I, we have requests for, for, for people, is it available in Python or R? We, at the moment, we don't have any plan to port this to Python yet. Uh, but so, so if, you're, if you're having problems, uh, let us know. <laughs> Nevertheless, I'm just, just going a little bit what redemption offers. 
it, it gives you, um, we, we give a user interface, which hopefully makes it easy for people to write mathematical models, uh, write, uh, so it, these are really just putting in, sorry, I need to get the cursor out, stoichiometry, uh, sorry, stoichiometry matrix here, the parameter values and what are the bounds of the parameters, initial conditions, loading the data, which hopefully be dynamic data in this case, and then uh, we also, if you desire, if you want to do pre-processing, uh, for example, smoothing, if that's something that you want to do, that you can do that also here. Uh, there's a module also in here, this is one of the key modules, is to estimate parameters given the data for the model equations that you uh, have written down. Yeah, so there's a module to do parameter estimation. Now, for the purpose of this talk, and this is where we are really pushing on the ensemble side, it also has a module to generate parameter ensemble. And what this gives you are a family of parameter combinations for which the um, for which the model would provide reasonable fitting to the data. Reasonable up to a certain threshold that you specify on the likelihood function value. Yeah? So, so with, the idea here is that with a click of a button and a simple uh, you know, data entering that you can, you can uh, do this. Um, by the way, uh, we are using a tool called Hyperspace to generate the parameter ensemble. And Hyperspace is a parameter exploration tool uh, written by uh, another group in uh, SIB, York Stellings Group and Andreas Wagner. And we have been uh, getting a really good success with that, with our tools. So here's an example where we, we applied this to a very simple, uh, applied redemption to a very simple network here, shown here. This is a metabolic network, a branch pathway. Um, so the idea is that if you were provide, uh, write down the equations in the, in the redemption and then provide uh, the data point shown here in the cross uh, for all the metabolites that um, this is sort of the output of the ensemble models that you get and this is a true dimensional projection of the parameter ensemble yeah so each so it's it's, it's consists of uh, in this case 60,000 dots blue dots and each blue dot is a parameter combination <clears throat> if you were to take five um, random points from this uh, ensemble, this is the, the fitting to the data. So the idea here is that you don't get a single model, but rather you have a family of models. Yeah? Each one differ uh, by the parameters values that they, it, it has. Yeah? And, and they all can fit the data reasonably well. Yeah? So um, for this particular task, what we want to do is account to be able to account for both the structure and the parametric uncertainty simultaneously by doing ensemble modeling. And let's see how we do that. And we're going to use this to also design uh, experiments. And this is the sort of the theme of the, today's uh, seminar. So we, I mentioned this earlier. The, this, we're going to be looking at um, the myeloid uh, gene regulatory network. Uh, this is published uh, by a group in uh, Sweden, in Loon. Uh, so, so what they have is they propose a network that looks like this, which is essentially consists of all possible arrows that you can put on, uh, on uh, three nodes. Yeah? And the idea is that given this data, can you uh, isolate the, the model? Yeah? And they did that already, and we're not going to repeat that. So essentially what they were able to do is, uh, with the experimental data that they have, this is the time series data of normalized expression level, and they were able to fit this and uh, narrow down from 32 different structures to 16 structures. Yeah, so, so, so they cannot narrow down to a single structure in this case. And this is, again, I would say one of the idea uh, that uh, the challenges that I mentioned earlier is, has to do with the underdetermined nature. So what do we do here is uh, we decided to expand this a little bit um, to look at not just the structures but also the parameter values. That, are, that can be, uh, you know, that you can have in each of the structure. So what we did is uh, we repeated this uh, data fitting. So given a structure out of the 16 possible, then I do a global optimization to do parameter, essentially to get the best parameter that fit, quote unquote, fit the data, yeah? So, and for each one of this, then I have a, a simple rejection criteria. If the profile, the simulated, a curve 
are within this bounds of 99 percent plus minus uh, standard deviation yeah so uh, three times of standard deviation sorry so 99 percent confidence interval then we accept the structure otherwise we kick it out yeah so that's the, the, the first thing that we did once we kick it out for whatever that remains we perform ensemble modeling looking at all possible parameter uh, combinations that could provide reasonable fit to the data by the same criteria of this plus minus uh, three sigma from the experimental data. And this again we use a hyperspace and use, we, can, we can use redemption to generate this. So from this what we get for 16 structures essentially for each one, so I'm, we numbered this one to 16, uh, a family of parameters. Yeah? And what I'm showing you here on this plot is the volume of that uh, parameter space. And that volume represents to us, in this case, is the uncertainty in the data regarding the parameters. Whereas the 16 structure represents the structural uncertainty. Um, this one varies between 19 to 25 parameters, roughly. So it depends on what edge you add and remove. Okay. Yes. Um, so immediately from 16, uh, two of them we, we can reject. Yeah, so we have now uh, 14 structures to start with. Now, in the design of experiments, uh, we're going to consider driving the system through what we call here the erythropoietin EPO. And this is something that you can do by putting the cells under hypoxic conditions. Yeah, so this is just to, to show that if you put the cell under 1% of oxygen for different uh, length of time, you can upregulate uh, EPO. Uh, for different uh, levels. So the design of experiments, uh, we borrow certain concepts from Michael Stump, the work of Mike Stumps in the uh, Imperial College. So the idea here, we want to come up with the experimental design, EPO level, that would maximize the utility. What is that utility function? Well, the utility is something that you can define, a, a metric that quantifies the informativeness in the data. For us, this is something that we borrowed from the Fisher information matrix, where we looked at um, the covariance matrix. Yeah? Either you look at the, uh, the one over the determinant of the covariance matrix, uh, different, uh, or just looking at the eigenvalues, maximum eigenvalues of the covariance matrix. We tried different things here. So the, the formulation looks like this. So this is the mathematics uh, behind it. So there is a utility function that captures, again, the informativeness of the data for a given EPO level. And we integrate this over the uh, posterior distribution provided that uh, new experimental data. Yeah? And the prior distribution is given here. Yeah, this is the priors that we get by constructing the ensemble modeling earlier. That's how we get them. Uh, so what the way we solve this is we treat whatever the terms in the inside the well the argument of the integral as an um, augmented probability that's the density function as a, using a surrogate uh, density function called H, and then we perform a Monte Carlo uh, random walk. Well, in this case, we, we actually had better success with uh, with simulated annealing. And to calculate the posterior distribution, we we use a technique called approximate Bayesian computation. And this is something that uh, essentially it is a Monte Carlo way also to construct a, the posterior distribution. Um, I don't think I have too much time to describe about the approximate Bayesian computation, but there is a very nice introduction about uh, how you construct posterior uh, distribution from using this method. And this is uh, in, in this uh, plus computational biology uh, paper. So uh, of course, with any Monte Carlo method, there is so the noise that you have to handle, and then you can only get you know, maybe asymptotic behavior that's very nice. But what, what you see from us here, and this is also something that we still are dealing with. So by the way, this is still unpublished work. We are still modifying a few things here. Um, the, we, have, we have to deal with issues regarding noise and stochasticity of the objective function that we are formulating. Nevertheless, what we saw here I don't know why this is, okay. Um, so this is uh, on the x-axis I'm showing different EPO level as a solution from the simulated annealing. 
and how many times the simulated annealing is giving us that solution. Yeah, so, so here you get EPO level, so you get high uh, frequency for the higher EPO, and in general, that unfortunately there is no clear optimal solution, optimal uh, experiment in this case. However, we, we, did, we did saw that for EPO of 10, the information is not that high, potentially here, because the, the simulated annealing didn't end up there very often. Okay, um, for uh, the proof of concept, we took one structure, which is structure 10, as the true structure, and then we can generate the data from that. And this is just an in silico test at the moment. Yeah? So let's pick one of the optimal experimental condition, which is the high EPO level of 730. And then we simulate the model, and then we, we use uh, Gaussian noise to, uh, to generate the data. And then using this data, the new data set, we're going to do the second iteration of that um, inference, yeah, of the modeling, uh, modeling inference. So, um, so we applied the same set, uh, the same step, sorry. In this case, not only using the, the original data, but also with the new data. And then let's take a look how many of the structures remain, remain in this case. So for, for, for uh, this EPO level of 730, we can kick out quite a large number of the structures with only three remaining there. And uh, it's, it's, in, well, it's encouraging to note that structure 10 remains there, yeah? because that's the true structure that we generated data with. We also tested different EPO level. The, the other uh, most visited uh, solution is 360, and we also did that. We also get, we were able to kick up most of the structure except three structures, and again, it's encouraging to see the structure 10 still remains there, because we know at, in this point, uh, or this example, that, that that is the true answer. Now, if we were to do the EPO level of 10, the one that we suspect to give us uh, low information, that uh, we can only kick out two additional structure from earlier. Yeah, so we still have about 10 remaining here. Oh, 13 remaining, uh, 12 remaining structures, sorry. So this is just to summarize what we did um, with this uh, structure identification uh, exercise. With the design of experiments, we were able to reduce from um, 14 structures that we started with to, uh, uh, in this case, three structures using the optimal uh, design of experiments. Whereas if you were to use this, less optimal solution that is, uh, you still have to deal with uh, quite a large number of structures. Okay, um, so that's all. So this is the, really the take home message. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm rushing things a bit at the end, but uh, I hope that I can meet the 45 minutes. <laughs> that might... Okay, so what I'm trying to uh, convey in, in the seminar, and I, I think something that perhaps, uh, something that you can bring home with you and when you uh, look at the modeling problem, when you start approaching a network inference problem in your work, is to, to think about uncertainty. Um, the cha th there's a lot of challenges in inferring biological networks beyond uh, undue determined nature of that, but I hope you could also start to think about uncertainty when you start, when you build a model for your biological systems. And what I'm showing you here is that embrace, by embracing that uncertainty, one could actually use it to then go back to your um, experimental partners and then tell them what are the, you know, the best, uh, the next experiments to do, yeah? So what I'm showing here is one strategy using Ensemble to tackle the underdetermined nature. Uh, this is uh, what I would, the benefit of that, I would quote unquote, is unbiased, but clearly this is assuming that the model equation is correct first, so that's clearly even uh, not valid. Nevertheless, by embracing this uncertainty, I think it's quite amenable. This is a, a, a nice framework for which you can also directly approach uh, design experiments, yeah? There is a drawback in this. It, 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 the fact that you do need to track and identify a large number of models, and in some applications, for example, using trace, you could have a compact way to represent this, but it's not necessarily always the case. Um, and what I found also looking at the literature, there are ensemble modeling approach uh, work, uh, publications. Uh, some of these are uh, 
still I would say in the ad hoc manner, some of this a, a little bit more organized. And I hope that um, more people are jumping onto this bandwagon of doing ensemble modeling and perhaps we could, as a community, come up with more tools where we can use ensemble, build ensemble, use ensemble uh, as a way, as a viable way to, to address uh, biological modeling. Um, finally, last but not least, I need to acknowledge, uh, show gratitude to uh, the funding agencies that pays the bill. Uh, we got received from Eteha Zurich uh, grants also uh, from SNF. These are the group uh, at the moment, um, as of uh, August, so it's uh, two months ago. And uh, I need to acknowledge Minhas who's doing the um, the Gene Regulatory Network, uh, the Gene Account Design of Experiments, and um, Lu Yang and Erica are the two that are doing the uh, the myeloid, the differential equation based uh, design of experiments. Uh, with that, I thank you again for your uh, for coming, for your kind attention, and for listening to me.